Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca, that's fitvegan.ca, and mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program, guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today we have a special treat for you with Dr. David West. How are you today? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I'm excited for people to understand your specialty. Could you give us a little bit of background uh, before we dive into today's topic about ultra food and our ultra food, oh my heavens, ultra processed food. There are some ultra foods, but ultra processed (laughs) foods and addiction and eating disorders and all that good stuff. Um, Would love to hear a little bit about your background. Sure, yeah. So I've always been fond of one-on-one work and I I started that early on. I can recall the early 20s, early days, college days. I worked as a trainer. I got into nutrition quite a bit, decided to really pursue that path the um, you know, the next step seemed to be registered dietitian. Um, I was a little bit on the fence about that path, but I trusted it. And um, you know, I could speak for days about my experience going through graduate school and becoming a registered dietitian. But needless to say, I ended up doing that. Worked in the field for many years, and then went on to get my doctorate in public health. I have a minor in health psychology. So I'm a mental health scientist and I try to bridge nutrition with mental health. And it Mm. seems like that's a much needed conversation and more and more people are having it. And it's super exciting, this new era of nutritional psychiatry and nutritional psychology. And there's just so much to unpack there. And I'm so thrilled to be here talking with you today. Absolutely. Could you give a little background about the nutritional psychiatry? Because I think that is absolutely fascinating, the whole genre. And it's so, you're absolutely absolutely right. It's so needed. Yeah. Um, Compared to nutritional psychology, I think about nutritional psychology as being a little bit broader, right? Mm -hmm. Like like incorporating social context and psychological factors, whereas nutritional psychiatry is definitely focused on the individual. And, um, you know, it it definitely has a functional medicine flavor to it. And really, it's about using more than just traditional methods to address mental health issues, um, lab testing, to look at uh, the biopsychosocial picture using a more comprehensive model. Um, A lot of people think about nutritional psychiatry as having uh, supplements either as opposed to medications 
or as an adjunctive treatment. So, you know, for example, augmenting an SSRI with, you know, folate and omega-3 and thinking about nutrient drug interactions. There's a lot of people that don't want to be on medications and would rather try with nutraceuticals, et cetera. So um, nutritional psychiatry also um, can be sometimes overlapping with this newer field of metabolic psychiatry, which mm -hmm. is really looking at how different diets affect not only uh, the body's metabolism, but the metabolism in the brain, which has some profound implications for some severe forms of mental illness, um, especially the treatment resistant type. There's a lot of interest in, you know, keto for some treatment resistant forms of mental illness. So it's, uh, it's got a lot there. Nutrition itself is a huge word. Is it food? Is it supplements? Right? So nutritional psychiatry is, um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really a movement. And interestingly, it's probably more popular outside of the U S so we hmm. see a lot of the work coming from Australia and the UK, and there's some folks in South America, Canada, there's a lot of uh, psychiatrists and uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners and other professionals here in the US. But I just mean in terms of like the funding and the mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. we're just not getting it over here. We're not getting a lot of things in our healthcare right. system. So let's, I think that's, that is a, that is no surprise to me. Um, so maybe we should speak to maybe ultra processed foods and where do those intersect with mental health or just health in general from your work? Yeah, thank you. I've spent a lot of time in the last two years really trying to understand ultra processed foods. I think the word processed foods has been thrown around quite a bit in the last decade or more, but now we have a very clear definition to separate processed foods from ultra processed foods. So we have a classification system using what's known as the NOVA classification, which comes out of Brazil, um, goes back as far as 2009, but it's really picked up steam in the literature in the last few years, um, separating food into four categories. The first is minimally processed food or unprocessed food. We tend to use minimally processed food because there's very few unprocessed foods. There's usually some small level of processing to it, unless you're growing food or raising animals. Category two is called processed culinary ingredients. These are things that are added to foods to make them more delicious, more palatable, and to have better uh, shelf life, storage, et cetera. So sugars, salts, fats, oils, flavors, um, anything you would do to uh, you know make a food more presentable, like uh, anything that would be served in a restaurant would most likely be considered um, category three, which is processed food. That's a combination of category one and category two. So you mix in uh, minimally processed food and you do something to it, and then you have processed food, right? Uh, processed food is normal. There's nothing wrong with processed food in my opinion. We processed food. What this new conversation has really done is separated processed food from ultra processed food. Ultra processed foods are foods that contain little, if any, intact category one foods. So when you look at them, you really can't really figure out what food groups are involved, right? Um, I use a food group system in my practice and I tell people, if you can't figure out which food group it belongs to, like maybe you should think about it. So it's usually food that's made from a series of industrial practices that most people couldn't do at home. It's usually a combination of just processed culinary ingredients and um, they are meant to be delicious and they're pre-digested and they hit the bloodstream quickly and they're fun and they are made for profit rather than public health. They're oftentimes marketed to children and they usually come with some pretty big budgets and some pretty intelligent strategy from, you know, the mega corporations. And so, you know, talking about food, I think we are in the era now where we can separate processed food from ultra processed food. And, you know, the estimates here in the U.S. says that, you know, over 60% of the foods consumed here in the United States 
are considered ultra processed food. And it's like, no wonder we're in a health crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So could you give some examples in case someone was still having some difficulty understanding between those three categories? Mm -hmm. That would be helpful. My, thank you. My probably best example is that category one, a minimally processed food would be corn on the cob. Right. And so we would you call that minimally processed because it probably it got cut and processed a little bit. If you were to take that one step further and cut it down and then um, can the corn, right? It would go through a process of being cut and washed and put into a solution. And then canned is a very, you know, well established form of processing. The ultra processed food is the Dorito. <laughs> right. It is the chip that was made from the corn that was turned into a uh, corn chip by really making the, the corn into, you know, a powder and then a sludge and then shaping it and then deep frying it. By the time the, um, you know, chip enters the bag and sits on the shelf, it has very little of whatever phytonutrients and sensitive minerals and vitamins that are in the corn left. Mm -hmm. It does have the macros. So you get the macros without the micros, right? <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, you know, potentially problematic in, in large amounts. And I'm a food positive person, right? Like there's enough diet culture out there in the world. And so I'm always just careful not to like you know, be scolding about the food industry. Be, I'm upset about it, right? But it's kind of like being upset about air pollution. Like, you know, it's like, you know, like we can make some change, but to be angry about it is 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 difficult. My my point is, there's um there's a problem with ultra processed food if you're eating a lot of it and not eating those other foods. Mm -hmm. Most people would argue that if you're eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains you know, organic, um, animal products, beans, nuts, and seeds, right. That like having some ultra processed foods, you know, can be somewhat supportive depending on the person. And I'm not Mr. Moderation here. I, I, I do think that, um, uh, there's just, um, a conversation there that needs to be added as well. Okay. Yeah. Which leads me to <laughs> the next question about ultra processed foods and food addiction. Can you explain yeah. that paradigm yeah. and what that is exactly so we can understand where we're actually speaking from we used to call it food addiction and um you know that came right around the same time 2000 late 2000 you know 789 um and that was created by a team of researchers validated at Yale using criteria for substance use disorders or you know, drug addiction or alcoholism, right? You kind of match up the criteria for drug addiction, alcoholism, and you put it to food, validated a measurements tool, and then the research just blew up, right? And it was a pretty exciting time. This was the early part of my career. Remember reading about this stuff. I was always interested in addiction recovery, always interested in nutrition. It was finally like, oh, these two worlds are coming together. But it was very much um, controversial. There was a lot of resistance against the concept. Um, a lot of it came from the eating disorder field because it seemed like it was, um, you know, an idea that was promoting restriction and more food rules. And there was a lot of resistance from the food industry, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just was early in my career, kicking back, kind of observing. I started writing some papers and I saw how charged this issue was. And um, I think we've come a long way, but one of the biggest, I think, advances in the last few years is that myself and many others have stopped calling it food addiction. And now we're calling it ultra processed food addiction. Mm. So we're saying, all right, let's remove the conversation about whether or not the almond or the banana is addictive. We're talking about cookies, cakes, right? S sodas, other branded packaged snack foods. These are the specifics of the food addiction conversation 
which um, makes it a lot more clear what we're talking about, but also makes it a lot more um, pointed toward the food industry because we're, uh, we're, we're not just talking about like, oh, this is a personal issue that people need to either seek recovery from or not. We're more saying this is a public health issue uh, and we need to talk about the food environment, right? That is, uh, um, you know, really creating a lot of unwellness. Lots that we can go in directions here. I think what most people would be curious about is first, what's happening on the physiologic level? If you could dive into that a little bit about what makes that an addiction. Like you mentioned, you hinted to it about the blood sugars and different things, but also, you know, in the brain, so to speak. If you could give a little bit of a background, what creates that addiction? What is the definition of the substance use addiction that that's going to be falling into? And then maybe what we can do to actively you know, kind of be a, a choice architect of our environment to make different choices to help us make better choices for our health long-term. If we could just start in that kind of progression, I think yep. that's where a lot of people would like to go. But can we just start with what start makes there. it food addicting? Yeah. Yeah. I think if you were to think about the entire process, right? From like visualizing the food, right? Leading up to the consumption, you already have the dopamine system working, right? We we once used to think of dopamine as reward, and now we think about it more as motivation and learning, right? So you start to make a prediction on what's coming, right? And the neurochemical cascade is already in motion. Um, there's uh, biological changes that happen before the food even hits the hits the mouth, right? <laughs> And I think that's worth acknowledging. We have a, a hormone called ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone. Um, there's actually a lot of really interesting interactions with hormones and brain chemistry um, that I've not, a, I'm, I can't say I'm an expert in, but I've sure tried, right? I've sure <laughs> tried to become one, right? Uh, but leptin, ghrelin, and insulin in particular have mm -hmm. some interactions with the the ventral tegmental area. And that's the sort of, you know, one of the kind of powerhouses for the dopamine system. Uh, but yeah, even in the mouth, right? Once someone takes the first bite, there's like a lot of sensory um, experiences, um, could be even linked to childhood emotions and memories. Uh, but generally we know that things that are easily digestible, so refined carbohydrates, things that have added sugars, salts, things that have a lot of mouthfeel. So um, usually it isn't just foods that have carbohydrates or fat, but a combination of the two. I always tell people, if you put a like a stick of butter, a bowl of sugar and a bowl of flour on the table, like I don't think most people would want any of them. But if you bring them together, right? And you put them in the oven for 20 minutes, you have one of the most powerful substances um, in humankind, the cookie, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, you have, you know, the trigeminal nerve detecting mouthfeel, you have already the uh, brain like expecting a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then as soon as, you know, the food enters, you know, the GI tract, foods that are low in fiber and, you know, high in sugar or other uh, refined um, you know, like rapidly absorb starches. We have a blood sugar spike and that is going to activate insulin. Insulin is going to signal to the brain. We are wired for like blood sugar being good, right? Cause we used to live in an environment of scarcity. We now live in abundance. So we have an evolutionary mismatch where we're getting a lot of signals from our body that are no longer supporting what would be optimum for our health. And we're probably gonna take a few uh, generations to evolve that one through. Um, but yeah, it's so there it. is, yeah, there's predictions, there's uh, oral um, sensory experiences, there's immediate blood sugar stuff. There's been some really interesting hypotheses about gut bacteria possibly being involved in a craving cascade. We know that um, 
you can get certain types of overgrowth from eating, for example, sugars or artificial sweeteners, and that they can exert an influence on the host and that they could actually work with the uh, reward system you know, produce toxins when or that lead to dysphoria when they don't get what they want, right? So that it's reinforcing. I've been super interested in this topic. And, you know, there isn't a ton of data there, but it matches what a lot of us see clinically mm. in terms of, you know, gut microbiota being involved in a craving cascade as well. Mm. But once you mix in gut bacteria and hormones, right, you've got systems biology in place. And right, we really think about addiction as something that centers in the brain. Um, and, you know, the best way that I like to summarize it is um, I once heard someone describe addiction as a learning disorder, that mm -hmm. the brain overlearns something. Um, but really why it becomes so difficult for people to stop is because a lot of these substances, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, um, sugar, right? Uh, uh, the list could go on with behavioral addictions, uh, ultra processed foods, what we're talking about today. Um, it, it learns that these things are survival promoting when in fact they are not. And the reason that they get uh, classified as survival promoting is because the dopamine system historically has been in place to promote our survival. It makes things like food and it makes things like sex reinforcing so that our, our species can, can carry on, right? Mm -hmm. If it wasn't motivating to do those things, like it would, it might not happen. So we have this neurochemistry to motivate us. And then we get um, heightened sense of motivation or drive or appetite or craving, however you want to call it, to consume. Um, it's funny, I have a 23 month old daughter and like I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing the things happen, right? Uh, the more cheese, right? Like, and I'm just like, I know too much. I know too much about the neurochemistry, but I'm, 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 I'm relaxing into it. But um, to summarize, in my opinion, the easiest way to remember addiction. And I'm not one of those single definition kind of guys. I believe that there's a lot of ways that things could be sliced and diced and understood. But the uh, the way that I like to remember and to teach the addiction concept is that it's the assignment of value to an experience that gets stored in the memory and that gets suggested even when the prefrontal cortex doesn't believe that it's a rational or logical decision. There is another part of the brain that has the ability to override common sense, to override the process of weighing the pros and cons and to exert its influence in order to get its needs met. So the word that I wanna offer our listeners today is salience. Mm -hmm. Something becomes more salient. It becomes more memorable. There is value that has been assigned to it. And even when there are other agendas, a salient memory of a substance has the ability to sort of influence our behavior in ways that are just baffling to people that don't have this type of a neurochemical cascade. Mm -hmm. So the average person. And I don't even, maybe the person with some sort of addiction is becoming the average person nowadays. Okay. The average person looks at someone who would make a choice that was against their best interest and just be baffled by it. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about the person that drinks alcohol after being sober for a year and they get their life together and then their life just falls apart. Why would someone eat that food after a month of not eating it when their labs just came back good? everything started looking great again, right? What is the cognitive process that leads someone to say, you know, do this? Um, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, the, the best thing is to not eat it. There are cases when, you know, it might be, and this is where this, this conversation is just loaded, right? With, you know, should someone be inclusive? and do moderation? Should someone like really stick to their guns and do abstinence, right? And there are just isn't answers for this at a, at, a, at a population level, at a podcast level. 
These are deep questions for each person to do some work on and some trial and error. Think about your own degrees of cognitive rigidity versus cognitive fluidity. Think about the context of your life. Think about your own degree of uh, black and white thinking. And there's so much there that goes into the conversation around, you know, food decisions, integrating what we call recovery into your life. And this goes from the dimension of nutritional psychiatry, which we talked about as being more biomedical and, um, you know, very uh, uh, lab focused to nutritional psychology, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about this bigger contextual conversation, which, you know, is a lot of the work that I get to do is just talk these things through with people, Mm -hmm. you know, because there's so much information out there. There's so many different things that work for people. Um, You know, if you were to look online, most people would say that food addiction or ultra processed food addiction is a, you know, condition that requires abstinence, right? Um, But there's a lot of other lanes there, right? In terms of, you know, harm reduction, you know, eating just real food and being um, lenient. It just, it just doesn't have to be all or nothing for some people. It does. Uh-huh. You know what uh, I mean? Most of the people I work with, it does because what happens, I'll just share my experience in the 20 years I've been a doctor um, and really focused on lifestyle for the last 12 was really seeing patients make wonderful strides eating, you know, a whole foods, the whole food plant-based diet in particular, what I typically work with. And um, they'll have something happen, usually the holidays and celebrations and family and watch it partake. And then they just fill on the downside. But what's great about that experience, instead of being upset about it, it's a great opportunity. So the quote unquote failure is an opportunity of learning and saying, okay, this is where I know my guardrails need to be set. Um, And I think it's great to let kids do that too, right? So when we were raising our children, they're all adults now, but we at home would eat a certain way. And this is the, (laughs) this is just the way we eat. But when they go out, they go make their choices, but their body would tell them, "Mm, I don't feel so good after eating, you know, big old pizza and a, and a cheeseburger and stuff like, okay, note to self. And now they're adults and they eat, you know, well. And um, so that that is a really interesting thing. Can we talk a little bit about where is the mismatch occurring? Like, so like you said, the people are making these decisions. We have such good intentions and people often, I'll hear patients go, I just don't understand why I keep making the same decision. Can we speak to the little bit, maybe to the health psychology part of your training? Why do we keep making those mismatches? Like we have values and we wanna be healthy, but we keep making these decisions. Can we talk about that habit loop or whatever you would consider that? Yeah. I love what you said about, you know, the sort of person that's on a wellness street that quote unquote falls off the wagon. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it becomes a, you know, learning experience, which is definitely how we would have to frame it in any sort of therapeutic setting. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Any kind of negative, um, stigmatizing energy is not supportive of health, right? So everything is a learning experience. We're always lifting ourselves up, you know, facing life again, right? Mm -hmm. But I think when you really understand addiction, when you really understand addiction, what you come to learn is that even another learning experience isn't going to be sufficient again to prevent that from like resurfacing because the mind has a very intelligent way of, you know, forgetting how you felt on that Monday morning when you were really grossed out about yourself. Mm -hmm. The mind has a way of really changing, um, uh, changing its mind, right? Mm -hmm. In those moments and coming up with a great reason why this is a good idea And it's so tricky to use pure logic Mm -hmm. to be what we call like an addiction like eating, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of this wisdom comes from 
you know, like, you know, recovery movements with alcohol that have been around for decades. It's this sort of assumption that, you know, self-knowledge is great, but it's not going to be enough. Right. And now we're getting out of the clinical realm a little bit. Right. Because obviously we want people to have knowledge of self and tools. But once there's a recognition that this sort of condition is just so insidious that mm. it can trick me. Mm. Right. And then like right. the goal becomes like, how do I make more peace with my mind? Mm. Right. How do I like not let my mind trick me? And mm. then the answer is like, oh, I need to meditate. I need to do journaling. I need mindfulness practices. I need to do breath work. And that's when it makes so much more sense why for food and body related issues, we need a much more holistic recovery centric approach. And it's a tough sell for people. I Hopefully I just convinced someone right now yeah. that like, if you have addiction like eating or what we sometimes call hedonic eating or reward-based eating, mm -hmm. right? If that has taken place in your neurochemistry, pure logic by itself will eventually fail you. Yeah, well, if not most of the time, because most rationalization, time. we can, <laughs> rationalization, right. just watch a child who he will come up with all sorts of excuses. You're basically, it's a child and you saying, okay, I need you to feed this. And this is what that little bit will be. I, so Judd Brewer, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with his work as a dear friend of mine and I love his work, but it speaks to looking at that habit structure, right? Of whatever is in, and really paying attention and being mindful and that mindfulness mm -hmm. disruption of the, of the habit loop and using that to decrease the reward value and seeing that entire habit structure kind of disintegrate on its own with the repeated practice and which is so powerful. I love mindfulness. I speak about it all the time to patients, but it's really interesting that they can uh, be aware they're observing the behavior and not actually partake in the behavior. They actually have a choice. And that's in and of itself, I think, uh, profound to some people. And once they really experience it. And so how do you help someone create these opportunities of mindfulness or disruptions of these habits that obviously have, you know, severe health clinical consequences if they keep going, you know, even though they're trying, but that they still struggle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'd love to know how, yeah. how does someone work with you on that? I would say that this, you know, toolkit that we're starting to build together and we're talking about what are some, you know, things that we could do in the moment to, uh, make it happen. Uh, they tend to work much easier when people are under less stress yep. and adversity, right? Yes. And, and that's just worth saying. There's 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 hard science there to link stress, trauma, and adversity to you know impulsive, addiction like loss of control behavior, right? Yeah. And we also need to not fall down the narrative of, oh, well, life is hard right now. Therefore, it, you know, I'm going to engage in these behaviors, right? Because uh -huh. life is hard. It'll always be hard. It'll always be hard. The moment we accept that, life gets easier. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> that day that we're all waiting for when all the dust settles and everything just gets smooth sailing, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Is well, I... I'm in my mid fifties. I'm still waiting for the dust to settle. But yeah. once you accept that the dust will never settle, it's like, oh, well, the dust doesn't bother me anymore. That's, That's right. really the piece that I think is important. Yes. I mm. love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think doing some of the, you know, deeper work there to get mm -hmm. some safety and stabilization is really, really important. Yeah. Right. Trying to make major you know, nutrition and lifestyle changes when there's a lot of unsettled stuff could yeah. create the kind of challenges that make you feel defeated. And yeah. then when you feel defeated, you're like, I tried that and it didn't work. Right. Yeah. Of right. course, there are times when people can't access some of the life stressors. You can't change certain things and you do the yeah. lifestyle medicine and then yeah. you're able to handle it better. Right. right. So it's exactly. a bi-directional relationship. I'm not saying one comes before the other, but don't underestimate the importance of the contextual factors in our life. They yeah. matter, right? Oh, they very much matter. <laughs> yes. As you know. Yeah. 
That's interesting. So can we, I guess my, my question would be also is when people realize that there are particular stressors that cause, you know, or initiate the behavior, the craving, whatever it is, how do you help them like identify that? Like, how yeah. do you help them become aware of what's actually occurring here, regardless of, you know, past traumas and such, and why that particular behavior may have manifested sure. to begin with? What are the tools that someone could actually implement in their lives to see some benefit and mark, start moving in the right direction? One thing I believe strongly in, and, and I might be biased here because I do a lot of work with eating disorders. So I'm very mindful of the language that I use in counseling, how I talk about food, right? People can pick up on rules like really easily, yes. right? Yeah. And so I have a strong radar for that, yeah. like at all times because of my background and, and the research that I've done and the one-on-one -on -one work that I've done for, for 11 years. Um, so that being said, I tend to help people focus on the what to do's more than the what not to do's. Mm -hmm. I believe if someone can build a very clear plan of all these incredible recovery centric activities to engage in, right? Yeah. Let's say we've got, you know, you're eating, you know, four times a day and, you know, your morning looks like this. And this is what, you know, these are the guiding principles that you look for at meals. You're trying to get all the colors. You're getting sunlight, right? You're getting, um, a massage once a month, you're going for a walk, you're doing yoga, right? You've got like this really robust, what I like to call recovery plan. Cause I work with a lot of people on a mental health journey, right? You've got this really awesome toolkit, um, of things to do. And then, you know, it becomes much more, uh, clear, you know, how to move forward. In other words, you know, and probably early in my career, you know, it's like, you know, it's like really uh, like, for example, the best example is like removing white flour, mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that most people would benefit from removing white flour from their diet. I mm -hmm. think I could say that there's going to be some people that have some restrictive eating patterns that want to eat it or places in the world where they use it and they're right. But let's say most people in the U.S. could at least reduce it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just unwise to tell someone to do that before you teach them how to make farro and make quinoa, you know, and to like use buckwheat, right? So it's like focus on the things to do first and then the um, kind of things that are uh, aversive, uh, challenging, harmful tend to like get the, you know, less over time. And then the tool that I like to encourage is food logging and journaling, you know, because if you check in with your hunger score beforehand, fullness score after you log your meal, you check off the food groups that were in there. And then, you know, you look at the colors at the end of the day, you do a reflection. What did I do? Well, you know, what could I, you know, improve on you're, you're actively engaging a recovery process around food, right? That takes a lot more effort than a lot of people are interested in, but you're gonna, you're gonna grow over time. You're going to improve. Right. And so, yeah, that's why I built the wise mind nutrition app, which is, you know, the tool that I made to help people be in the moment with the mindfulness to be able to log their food have a place where you can do meditations, journaling, homework, assignments, et cetera. And, you know, there's a lot of really cool apps out there, you know, that I think people connect to. A lot of people don't connect to apps. Let's just say that you're just not, I don't want an app. I want a person, right? <laughs> um, but right. we are moving in that direction in the world. Right. And, um, you know, the one thing that's different about why is my nutrition is that it's a nutrition for our mental health app and it doesn't have calories and macros in it. Mm -hmm. And that's just because of my bias that I shared with you about my sensitivity around quantitative nutrition. Right. I'm really trying to change the conversation to more qualitative nutrition, 
Right. Not to say that quantities don't matter. They do. Right. But right. when you think about qualitative nutrition, you're thinking about things like, you know, degree of processing, conventional versus organic, right? How hungry were you? How full were you? What were your feelings, et cetera? And it's just a different conversation that's not as sexy, but, you know, we're trending, you know, we're, uh, we're making waves, you know, for people that want to opt out of the kind of more traditional diet culture energy. Right. Well, I think it's a, it's a breath of fresh air because we have obviously a, we have people who are struggling in either be health or mental, whatever that might be, B, they need to get healthier. They have, they, that is where they want to be. And we keep doing the same things over and over again, you know, again, bad diets and right. not paying attention to this. And we need to start asking different questions. So That's we'll right. come up with different solutions. And it's exactly what you're doing is this qualitative diet, eating more whole unprocessed foods will allow you to not only feel better, but then get away from, you're going to naturally have a lower calorie count <laughs> That's right. most of That's these right. foods. And you will see some changes in the micronutrients as well, which will really affect your health. Um, mm -hmm. um, hundred percent agree with that. So can we tell us a little bit also about how people can choose to work with you and how does that work? Because um, I think there could obviously be some folks here in the audience that would benefit. Yeah. My clinical practice is called nutrition in recovery and that's at nutrition and And you could tell from the name that it's slanted towards people that are on a, on a real healing path. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it's not just eating disorders and addictions. I, I like to kind of think about us all being in recovery somehow, right? We're mm -hmm. all on some sort of a recovery journey. I do a lot of functional medicine work. Um, I have a couple other dietitians that work alongside with me. So there's some options there. And um, I love the one-on-one -on -one work. I'm able to do it with people all over the globe. So I'm very fortunate in that way to be able to provide some virtual care um, to a lot of different people. I love complex cases. I love challenges. I work with all ages. And um, you know, the Wise My Nutrition app is sort of a complement and a companion to my practice, but there is a lot of people using the app as a no cost, low cost treatment option without using a provider. It is built for people to um, get some information, do some journaling, uh, get some new things to think about, uh, some, uh, some you know new energy, move the energy around a little bit. And, uh, yeah, it's great because, uh, now, you know, people that have, um, financial concerns can access my teachings and education very easily through the app. Um, I'm of course all over social media on Instagram, Dr. David Wiss, and I have, you know, why is my nutrition on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Um, trying to put out content that is like I said, symbolic of a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, it's, it's intersectional work. It's about uh, recovery. It's, it's non-diet, but it's not the predictable eating disorder narrative mm -hmm. of like, just eat all foods and don't worry about anything. Like that <laughs> message doesn't resonate with me at all. Right. <laughs> but the really rigid, like we're doing keto, for, you know, addiction and we're counting, you know, we're weighing and measuring food. I don't right. like the extremes that are out there in the world and yeah. social media really favors extremes, right? Yeah. So I'm just sure. trying to be like a voice of sanity in the middle, <laughs> a voice of reason in this right. unsafe nutrition environment. And I do mm. talk a lot about some of the social justice issues, you know, my my PhD is in public health and I'm a revolutionary. And I do believe that, you know, ultra processed foods are, are a social justice issue mm -hmm. and that, you know, oh, yeah. Yes. You yes. can spend an entire hour talking just about that. Alone. That's the one, you know, a hundred percent, 100%. Well, this has been fantastic. Uh, any final words you'd like to share with the audience before we go today? Yeah, I think that it's important to remember not to uh, look back 
and try to chase health and chase bodies of yesteryear. Mm -hmm. That it's really important to like live in today and learn how to look forward. There's a lot of um, health that exists in the world, even though we're living in the era of chronic disease, we're also living in an era of wellness and that it's something that we can grasp and it's not just biomarkers, it's uh, it's mental health, it's, you know, social context. And when we bring it all together, you know, we have holistic health and it's such an important part of my life and I know it's a part of yours. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think mean, that's lovely. And, um, We'll have all the links below in the show notes if anybody would like to connect with Dr. Wiss. So appreciate your time today. We really um, am glad that you're here and keep doing your good work. We need more of that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome.